So welcome to Peace Prospects in the Biden Era. I'm sure you're looking forward to tonight's discussion as much as I am. This event and the book launch is organized by PeaceQuest, the Rideau Institute, the World Federalist Movement Canada, and the Sisters of Providence of St. Vincent de Paul. My name is Bridget Doherty, and I'm your moderator for this evening's event. The format of the discussions will begin with the author, Honorable Douglas Roach, and a short reading of a passage from his latest book, Recovery, Peace Prospects in the Biden Era. I will then invite Mr. Roach to share the presentation screen with Fergus Watt for a general discussion of the book, focusing on peace prospects under Biden. From there, Mr. Watt will direct the discussions to human security, at which time he will invite Peggy Mason into the panel, followed by nuclear weapons with participation from Tamara Lorenz. There will be two brief question and answer periods. If you would like to ask a question, please submit it using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can do this throughout the, uh, throughout the discussions at any time. When we come to question time in the program, I will do my best to have your questions answered, time permitting. Uh, there's also the chat button at the bottom of your screen, so please feel free to use that for, for, for comments. If you want to share some links and, and some information, you're welcome to use that throughout the evening as well. Now, I'm honored to introduce this evening's panel. Honorable Douglas Roach, Officer of the Order of Canada, is a former Senator, Member of Parliament, Canadian Ambassador for Disarmament, and Visiting Professor at the University of Alberta. He was elected Chairman of, of the United Nations Disarmament Committee at the 43rd General Assembly in 1988. His previous books include The Human Rights to Peace, which was published in 2003, and The United Nations in the 21st Century in 2015. He holds nine honorary doctorates. In 2018, the International Peace Bureau awarded him the prestigious Sean McBride Prize for his indefatigable work, in particular as president of the UN Association, and who, as ambassador for disarmament during the height of the Cold War, helped maintain strong Canadian public support for the, the ideals of multilateralism in one of the most turbulent times in our modern history. In 2010, the city of Hiroshima named him an honorary citizen for his nuclear disarmament work and particularly for founding the Middle Powers Initiative. In 2009, he received the Distinguished Service Award of the Canadian Association of Former Parliamentarians for his promotion of human welfare, human rights, and parliamentary democracy in Canada and abroad. Fergus Watt is the Executive Director of the World Federalist Movement Canada. His work with civil society to advance global governance reforms and the rule of law has included participation in a range of broad-based networks in Canada and internationally. He presently serves as coordinator for the Coalition for the UN We Need, which works to build support for initiatives to strengthen multilateralism and the United Nations system. Peggy Mason is a former Canadian ambassador for the disarmament to the UN and is currently president of the Rideau Institute and lead author, author of the blog at ceasefire.ca. Tamara Lorenz is a PhD candidate in global governance at the Balsillie School for International Affairs at Wilf Wilfrid Laurier University. She has a master's in international politics and security studies from the University of Bradford and a law and MBA from Dalhousie. She's a member of the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And she's a fellow with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. Now, let us begin. I will turn over the presentation screen to Honorable Douglas Roach. Well, thank you, uh, Bridget. Uh, thank you very much. And hello to everyone. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, PeaceQuest uh, you, Bridget, and your colleagues uh, for sponsoring this event, along with the World Federalist Movement and uh, Fergus Watt and the Rito Institute, with Ambassador Peggy Mason. And I'm very pleased to have my friend Tamara Lorenz uh, on the panel 
II. Um, this uh, book is, uh, is called Recovery, Peace Prospects in the Biden Era. And I began the book, uh, writing the book last summer before the United States election. Um, but I felt sort of inside me that, that in the end, Joe Biden would be elected. And I began to research his, um, his positions on the peace issues. And I, it's, it's hard because peace is such a broad subject. It's, it's, it, you need to be, be able to focus on it. So I focused on the four pillars that the United Nations has cited as the basis for peace in the world economic and social development, um, environmental protection, uh, arms control and disarmament, and uh, human rights. And I began to look at his positions and uh, what the United Nations is saying on these very subjects. And uh, as I uh, continued my research and started writing, I felt my own spirits rising uh, during the summer and fall when I realized that uh, there could indeed be a great president uh, enter the White House if it were Biden to win, which he did in a tumultuous way. And the hangover from that is still affecting the United States and indeed the world. But we have turned a major corner in world affairs. And uh, Joe Biden, whom I had uh, the pleasure of meeting uh, at a conference in 2001, we were both on the same panel in, in Philadelphia, um, Biden, is, uh, is basically an ameliorator, one who reaches out to others in a, co in, a, in a spirit of cooperation. Now, we all know how terrible the conditions are in, uh, politically in the United States, and uh, Biden is going to be forced to use this very slim majority he has to push through his programs, but he is showing right at the start the immense amount of money for the COVID relief and now an equal amount of money for the infrastructure programs, that he's thinking big. And he's, he's already setting himself in the style of Franklin Roosevelt, who brought the social security arrangements in the 1930s, and Lyndon Johnson uh, in the 1960s, who overcame Southern opposition uh, to advance civil rights legislation. So while I do not present, I do not present uh, Joe Biden as the savior of the world. I don't feel that at all. But he is going to be able to turn uh, the, if, if he can rebuild uh, the strength of the United States and then consequently having that flow out into renewed leadership in the world through advanced multilateralism, then I think there are really some significant reasons for hope. And that's, that's why, I, uh, that's why I, I wrote the book. Uh, I've been asked to... Um, read a small section at the very beginning. So this will take maybe two, three minutes, if you'll allow me. So this is this section I'm going to read is uh, near the near the end of the book. It's I, I start the the first priority of all governments at this shaken moment must be catalyzing and coordinating a comprehensive global response to COVID-19 and conjoining these efforts with pressure on regional warring parties to implement a global ceasefire. Even if he only gave words of encouragement in this process, instead of denigrating them as his predecessor did, President Biden would have an enormous influence on strengthening the prospects for general peace and human security in the years ahead. The United States under Trump was an impediment the America firsters will not disappear in the Biden era. And the opposition to the US playing a major constructive role in building up institutions for peace will undoubtedly be as vociferous as those who oppose Roosevelt's efforts to bring his fellow citizens out of isolation to fight in World War II in order to maintain peace in the world. The world has since moved on in rejecting war as a means of resolving conflict. But the enmities that drag people down still have to be faced. To discuss the renewal of the framework for peace that the UN has put in place over seven decades is to open up a list of reforms that are still needed. Foremost is the expansion of the permanent members of the Security Council 
to include Germany, Japan, India, Brazil, and either South Africa or Nigeria. A restricted use of the veto possessed by the present permanent members and a new more equitable sharing of costs for all UN projects. All these proposals have been examined, one would say even to death, over the years and the result is always the same. The antiquated machinery lumbers on. This is not good enough. But to tear down the framework built over the years because it has not ended all wars, ended all poverty, or ended all discrimination would return civilization to a jungle mentality. We must cooperate to make the best of our existing circumstances. That is why the success of Joe Biden, an ameliorator, is so important. Holding the present world together is a prerequisite to building a better world tomorrow. The tasks ahead are daunting. Strengthening the multilateral machinery to head off rising nationalisms, provide global public goods such as vaccines, health services, and education to vulnerable peoples, use the sustainable development goals as the main framework for economic and social policy guidance, invest heavily in renewable energy, negotiate the elimination of nuclear weapons, prevent the weaponization of outer space and cyberspace, incorporate human rights into all policies, transfer, at least at the start, 10% of military budgets to human development. Putting our shoulders to the wheel in all these issues will lift us out of the present doldrums. A stabilized and safer world will come into better view as we move through perhaps the greatest transformation in human conduct in history. That is the journey from a culture of war to a culture of peace. It is beyond question that the journey has started and perhaps possible that the youngest babies today may live to see the arrival. It will not be a perfect world by any means. The seeds of nonviolence by those who have already grasped nonviolence in all its aspects as a core value will have to bloom. Human beings are not destined for war or extinction. The very inventiveness of human beings, who every day are developing conflict resolution machinery to avoid war and rushing the full use of renewable energy to head off the fatal global warming, shows that we are creating our own future, not passively abandoning ourselves to fate. Thank you for listening to that opening passage and I'd be very happy to, to uh, go into a dialogue with you on this. Thank you, Doug. Um, from a culture of war to a culture of peace, I read, they're very strong words. Thank you for sharing that. Now I'd like to invite Fergus up to join the panel. And while we wait for Fergus, uh, I'd like to remind participants and audience members to use the Q&A button at the bottom for any questions that you may have, and also feel free to write comments in using the chat button. Thanks. Thanks, Bridget. And uh, I think, uh, Doug, you picked a, an excellent section to uh, uh, provide a, a representative overview of the book. Um, but I'll, I'll just add uh, my two cents worth. Um, um, I think this is uh, um, this is a book that is is uh, although it's short, it's only 120 pages. It is uh, well written, and uh, Doug's writing is economical and to the point, uh, and and therefore it covers a lot of ground in in uh, in those 120 pages. Uh, and not, notwithstanding the brevity, uh, the book is, is dense with ideas uh, for progressive political change. Doug, Doug identified the, the, the various sections. This is uh, um, you know, written by someone with a very sophisticated understanding of the multidimensional aspects of peace. And, 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 and uh, um, we'll, we'll get into some of those um, 
uh, specifics in terms of a discussion of human security and a discussion of nuclear weapons uh, a little bit later. Uh, what I'd like to do is, is uh, focus a little bit about, about the current historical moment because the book is very current. It, it, it brings us up to uh, 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 the, the period just after the election of President Biden, although it does not cover the, uh, uh, the January 6th storming of the US Capitol, but um, perhaps we can uh, uh, in the discussion get into, um, I, what I'd like to do is, is focus a, a little bit more in addition to what you said a moment ago, Doug, on, on uh, what the Biden presidency might mean and, um, uh, and then, and, uh, you know, get a sense of, of, uh, uh, of the, the historical moment, because this is a, um, a key turning point uh, from the, the, uh, the, the reckless and, and corrupt Trump administration to, to, uh, to the Biden administration. Um, so I, I'd like to start just as we focus on Joe Biden, there's, a, there's a, another book uh, that I recently waded through written by Barack Obama. And there's a, 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 an interesting quote that's very revealing about Joe Biden in that book. Uh, uh, the context for this quote is uh, uh, President Obama's first National Security Council meeting. And Fred, you'll recall that uh, Barack Obama was elected as, uh, with a mandate to withdraw American troops from Iraq. Uh, and this, this meeting uh, with, with Pentagon advisors and so on uh, was one where uh, they, were, they were contemplating uh, 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 increasing troops in Afghanistan. And um, so uh, uh, I'm just reading here, Obama had been elected, uh, uh, as I said, with uh, uh, a mandate to get troops out of Iraq. Um, uh, but uh, Joe Biden opposed uh, increasing troops in, in Afghanistan. He called it a dangerous quagmire. And after the meeting was over, um, uh, uh, Biden uh, cornered <laughs> Barack Obama and he grabbed him by the arm and he said, listen to me, boss. Maybe I've been around this town for too long, but one thing I know is when these generals are trying to box in a new president, and he says, uh, Biden pulled him close and, and whispered to him, he, he said, don't let them jam you. Um, well, they, they did jam him. <laughs> you know, Obama did increase the, the troop presence in Afghanistan, and we're seeing now uh, a Biden presidency where they, they you know, uh, the, the Americans are, are withdrawing and, and uh, hoping to complete the last stages of a, of a peace uh, settlement in Afghanistan. Um, but so here we have a snapshot of, of Joe Biden as someone who, who gets it in terms of the military industrial complex. But Doug, you've called, you've called him um, uh, an ameliorator, a, a pragmatist. And, and uh, um, so I just, I just like to invite you to, to say a little bit more about what what you think we can expect from 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 Joe Biden, and then and then maybe we can also talk about a bit about uh, how he's done. You mentioned you mentioned the uh, uh, um, the relief and and infrastructure investments. You know how you think he's doing in in the first couple of months. Yeah, thanks, Fergus. Well, uh, Joe Biden recognizes that his first uh, duty is to the American people and to recover some strength and uh, he he's entered the White House at a time uh, when uh, the greatest humanitarian crisis uh, that the world has faced since the Second World War is taking place you know between the issues of uh, COVID-19 and, and uh, climate change and conflict and uh, here's the Secretary General of the United Nations uh, very deeply concerned about the mix that has created this sort of multiple emergencies. So where does Biden start? So he has to start with his own people and, and, and getting some relief to, to them. What has happened already, even though he's not yet at the first 100 day mark, is that Joe Biden has shown a recovery of government. Um, we went through the 1980s with Thatcher and Reagan uh, and the neoliberalism uh, denigration of government, you know, when Reagan used as a laugh line 
the, prob the, the, the most dangerous words in English language are, I'm from the government, I'm here to help you. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's government, you know, characterizing government as the problem. And so this uh, diminishment has had uh, severe repercussions on, on how the United States uh, has been able to hold its own society together and lead. So Biden, is, it comes out of, out of, if you want to call it the establishment, go ahead. But I mean, he comes out of, of, of a knowledge base and experience on how government works. And he's bringing government back into the center of uh, helping vulnerable people. And that is really a, a social justice agenda that he has in, in addressing problems of racism and inequality uh, through, uh, through, the, through the prism of, of the COVID relief and now building up the infrastructure. So when he, when he, if he's successful in doing this, and of course he's got tremendous opposition because the, the, the uh, political process is so polarized in the United States, Biden has to overcome that uh, to the extent that he possibly can with the narrow majorities that he has, and thus put the United States back on an even keel. And while he's doing that, then begin his outreach into the, into the world. He's already done that by, by, by uh, putting some new energy into the uh, Russia-US relationship by extending the START agreement and, uh, and reopening the cold question of uh, the Iran agreement uh, on, on, on Iran's nuclear weapons. So these are still very, very early stages, but I see Biden gradually reaching out. I mean, he's called for a summit of democracies. He recognizes that uh, the essential struggle in the world today now is narrowing down into whether democracies are capable of responding to human needs in the era of COVID, or is it going to be autocracies that deny human rights and, and push people around as we're seeing in, 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 the, in the major states, certainly in, in, in China and Russia, and by extension, what's happening in Myanmar. So, I mean, Biden has a huge agenda and he has to begin the process of reaching out to reestablish credibility and uh, by showing respect for other people's views. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a hallmark of doing a respect. Sure, and and the, if you if you read some of the uh, the, the commentaries among American uh, uh, analysts, uh, there's there's uh, many of them many of them see uh, a Biden pre presidency as uh, a return to American uh, leadership in the world, um, but 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 there's different there's different uh, senses in what one means by american leadership in the world is it is it american leadership of a multilateral order in terms of partnership with with uh, um, as you say democracies and and other states or is it, is it leadership are we are we um, uh, is is it uh, a return to american preeminence as, as uh, and and winding back the clock to the old days i think there's still um, there's there's differences of opinion amongst amongst uh, uh, the American uh, establishment on on some of these questions. Are, are is America the new leader or the new partner uh, for for others in the world? And and uh, um, how do you see Biden uh, navigating uh, international relations in that? In this yeah, context? yeah, I see Biden very much in a partnership mode. Um, he certainly does not represent the bullying kind of leadership that we saw the last four years in the White House. Uh, Biden uh, recognizes that uh, uh, the United States, uh, it, 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 by its very strength, its economic strength and, 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 and its, its whole history of, 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 of building, building, building and extending democracy uh, is, is uh, it, 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 it is, is itself a leadership for the world, but without imposing uh, all its views. The United States still is very strong, and um, I mean, its military bases around the world, I mean, it, it is still far too militaristic um, and uh, dominant, but it, it uh, at least Biden is not using the word indispensable, which Madeleine Albright did, and, and, and uh, it, uh, 
that pushing the idea that the United States is, is the indispensable nation in the world, it seems to have given way now to a Biden philosophy in which uh, there is uh, a more, um, well, I wouldn't exactly call it humble, but, but there's a recognition that the United States is, is one of the one of, of the major powers and that it's going to have to deal respectfully with other, with other countries. So I do feel that about Biden. Yeah, and, and you mentioned uh, a few times the, the, the summit of the democracies and so on. And uh, uh, there, is, uh, there was a, a report from a Canadian parliamentary committee uh, a few years ago that uh, was followed through by this government. And they now have a, a fairly substantial budget for, for democracy promotion. Uh, you'd never know it, uh, you know, uh, uh, judging by the emanations from from our, our, our some of our uh, political leaders that that this was a priority. But perhaps with Biden in the lead, this uh, Canada and and uh, um, assisting uh, democracies around the world might uh, might be a you know a vocation for uh, uh, for this country. How do you how do you see uh, the Biden influence? Uh, on Canada generally, will this will this drag us out of our our uh, our torpor and our shell, <laughs> or, or or are we beyond hope? <laughs> what a great question! What a great question. Um, well, no, I don't think Canada's beyond hope. Uh, we did lose two consecutive elections to the Security Council over a ten-year period, which ought to tell that which ought to tell the leadership in Ottawa something, uh, namely that uh, you know it's been attributed to. Um, uh, insufficient uh, peacekeeping and uh, insufficient uh, in international aid. And that's why Ireland and Norway uh, beat us in the competition for the two seats for the Security Council in the last round. Uh, but uh, it, I, I think that the main thing is that Canada lost a sense of confidence. Um, we've had some great Canadian leadership in the past with Lester Pearson, you know, who won the Nobel Peace Prize on, on peacekeeping. And, and Pierre Trudeau went around the world in 1983 to the, all the uh, capitals of the nuclear weapon states, pleading with them to cease the, the nuclear arms race. And three, that what Canada is not going to join in the Iraq war. I mean, and there are more examples. Canada is one of the, as, as the principal founder of the Landmines Treaty and, and a driving force and responsibility to protect and, and the International Criminal Court. I mean, I, I've been very proud of this thing. I mean, we're going to hear from Peggy Mason in a minute, and I'm sure she feels the same way I do. And when we were representatives, official representatives of Canada at the United Nations, and, and I was always proud uh, to be a Canadian uh, uh, because of the history of our country. But uh, th this, uh, this certainly fell by the wayside during the Harper years. There's no other way of putting it. Starting 2011 on, it, it was just a, a, a diminishment of Can Canada's role. And, and, uh, and as a consequence, we lost, we lost, we lost our confidence. Uh, Justin Trudeau came in in 2015 and said, Canada's back. It was a wonderful slogan. But uh, it uh, it didn't uh, really have uh, have the body to, to 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 fulfill it, and so we're still struggling, and we're still trying to find our way. And I, I'm I'm sure in a few minutes we'll be talking about the treaty and the prohibition of nuclear weapons, and that's an excellent example of Canada failing to lead, failing to recognize its own responsibilities, and uh, so uh, the I don't want to be I don't want to be too hard on uh, the officials in the, in the in the in the Ottawa circuit there down there in Ottawa uh, because you know I, I kind of understand where they are but but uh, but I'm not impressed by the outflow of ideas or the or the strength of the courage and the political uh, dimension the, the, the knowledge of politicians it's so weak uh, so that the combination of uh, of a lack of drive and a lack of a lack of accepting our responsibilities for the world. I mean, so now we have this COVID moment, and uh, I do see tr Justin Trudeau moving on COVID, and uh, I do, and I want to give him credit for having criticized him. I, I want to give him credit for what he is doing, but uh, Canada is nowhere near yet uh, um, implementing the strengths and the potential of this country as a uh, middle power leader 
in the essential fields of human security. And that's what I want to put in my book, uh, Deal. Okay. Um, we lost uh, uh, the last couple of sentences of, of uh, that sentence, Doug, but uh, um, you, you did reference uh, human security as, and, and uh, in my overview remarks, we, we mentioned this as uh, one of the uh, uh, strong elements, the, the, the comprehensive uh, and, and sophisticated uh, views on, on uh, you know, what, what constitutes peace and security. And, and so I'd like to bring Peggy Mason in to, um, to, to dig a little deeper on this, on this question of, of human security uh, and, and uh, how, it's, how it's presented in, in peace prospects in the Biden era. Peggy, are you there? Yes. Uh, yes, there was, a, there was a mini crash of Zoom, which I've never experienced before, which delayed the video coming on, but thank goodness, <laughs> thank goodness it came on. Um, before uh, expanding on these uh, on these crucial points on human security, which are woven throughout uh, Doug Roach's book, I want to first express my pleasure at being part of this discussion and my deep appreciation to my friend and colleague Doug Roach for his most timely, compelling, and most importantly, hopeful book. Turning to human security, well before, but even more so since the onset of the pandemic, we at the Rideau Institute have been looking at the topic of rethinking security, what some now call a pande pandemic pivot or a global human security reset, call it what you will. We summarize some of this thinking in some of our blogs, including four statements that I think are really relevant to our discussion of human security here this evening. The first is from Dr. Michael Ryan, head of the World Health Organization Health Emergencies Program, who stated, and this was very early on in the pandemic, when this is done, we need to sit down and see what kind of society we want to have in the future. Are we to be defended from foreign armies or are we to be defended from viruses? Where are we putting our investment in society, our civilization, and our way of life? The second quote is from the UN Secretary General at the virtual opening of the 75th General Assembly. He stated, today we face our own 1945 moment. And like the post-war generation that sought to build a new world order, we too must summon the collective will to address the world challenges to come. COVID-19, the COVID-19 crisis is a wake up call and a dress rehearsal for those challenges. Third statement is from Daryl Kimball, head of the prestigious Arms Control Association who wrote, if we are to, sur to survive well into this century, there must be a profound shift in the way we deal with global security challenges and how we align our scientific, economic, diplomatic and political resources to address the health, climate and nuclear dangers that threaten us all. The final comment comes from me. From rethinking security on a global scale, let us come back to our own country and specifically to Canada's defense budget, where as Doug's book recalls, the government announced on 7 June 2017, a whopping 70% increase over 10 years with most of the new funds being delivered after 2021. Yet for the last 10 years, the Department of National Defense has been unable to spend the annual monies allocated. At least $2 billion per year has thus accumulated since the 2017 budgetary increases were announced. It does not take a genius to figure out that these unused funds are ripe for redeployment to address urgent human security needs. So two core issues are setting the right priorities and funding them adequately. And we as citizens all have a role to play in that. 
Back to you, Fergus. Well, I think um, uh, the appropriate thing would be to ask Doug to respond to some of those, those quotes and, and uh, um, I wouldn't call them assertions. They're very, very poignant observations. Doug. Well, yeah, thank you, Peggy. Uh, I agree with every single word uh, that you said and you referred to Dr. Ryde, the UN Secretary General, Daryl Kimball, and not least yourself in priorities and funding. And I have called uh, in the book uh, for uh, Canada to, uh, let me start this way. The, the total, the total uh, uh, world spending on arms is $1.9 trillion a year. And uh, that was la the last figures available. And the total amount of money that's spent on all the United Nations work, not just the administration, the peacekeeping, but the, the plethora of by all the agencies, every human need is being touched by the UN. The total is $30 billion. This means that the world is spending on um, peace and development issues through the United Nations system 2.7% of what it spends on arms. That is outrageous. And uh, uh, the Secretary General uh, has called for a global ceasefire and, and you know, and he's, he's called for more money for COVID and, uh, relief and, and, uh, and the COVAX system and all of that. The Sustainable Development Goals need a, a huge in, insertion of, of funds to make them fully applicable. So, um, if you take 10% of uh, $1.9 trillion, which the world is spending on arms, and if you could convert 10% of that into health and education and all those measures that are needed for, to, for uh, on human security issues, that would amount to $190 billion, $190 billion. That is not an inconsiderable sum. And uh, uh, but to try to get the focus of uh, the uh, of the world's governments on such a cut, even though it's minor, to the total totality of what's being spent at arms, it's very difficult to do. And I'll just I'll close this comment by just referring to efforts that are being made. This is not pie in the sky to suggest that 10% of present military expenditures be converted to. Um, a, a, a wide COVID agenda of health and education and so on. In the United States, uh, two lawmakers, uh, Senator uh, Ed Markey, a not inconsiderable politician, by the way, uh, and uh, Representative Ro Khanna from California, Markey's from Massachusetts, uh, have introduced their latest effort to stop the development of uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles and use the associated funding for coronavirus prevention and they've introduced legislation to this effect. So I would like to see some Canadian uh, parliamentarians introduce some legislation or, or a bill, or at least have a debate. We don't, we don't even have a debate in the parliament on these subjects, but to get a conversation started in the Canadian public about shifting, as Peggy rightly, uh, rightly has excoriated, this 70% rise, can you imagine that the Canadian government intends to defend, to increase our defense expenditures by 70% in the time that we've now entered the, and uh, uh, that requires an entirely new mode of thinking of how to build security. So all of us here, I mean, uh, uh, if, when, I, when I'm asked, you know, what can I do? Or, you know, everything's too much, da, da, da. I say, well, look at raise your voice, send a letter to the government. We communicate our desire that Canada, you know, start to lead the way in a shift away from the militaristic mentality into the, into recognizing that the new period in which we've entered, which coronavirus is such a dramatic example, requires um, funding for human security. Peggy, did you uh, want to follow up? Yes, yes. Um, I, it seems to me that we will never get our security priorities right without deliberately articulating our intent to make the shift 
to human security or what we at the Rito Institute along with a range of civil society organizations call sustainable common security as the core operating organizing principle and goal of our national and international peace and security policy. Among other things, this would include a much greater emphasis on war prevention and peaceful conflict resolution and giving priority at every turn to building and strengthening the United Nations envisaged by its charter. This in turn means, and this goes to the funding question, Canada announcing a plan for achieving 0.7% of GDP for our development assistance within a five year time frame at most. Don't just make the commitment. Number one, make the commitment. Number two, have a time limited period in which we're going to do it. Meeting basic global human needs must be our first priority as Doug's book makes so clear. It also means other things for Canada, like making UN peacekeeping, not just fully re-engaging like they keep promising us, but making UN peacekeeping and building sustainable peace the Canadian defence priority. And now I want to come back to Doug's comment about, uh, he made it originally and then reiterated in our last discussion, about supporting the UN Secretary General's call for a global ceasefire. Well, of course, Canada has given wonderful declaratory support for that global call. We even went out and signed up a whole bunch of countries supporting uh, the call, but we haven't acted. We haven't acted by ending arms exports to Saudi Arabia that in the words of the UN expert group are helping. I mean, Canada specifically named and shamed as helping to fuel the deadly devastating conflict in Yemen. So we can we have to re, we have to reorganize our funding priorities. We have the money; it's where we decide to spend it, and we have to make this deliberate commitment to um, to fulfilling to you know to building the UN as envisaged by the UN Charter. I mean, there's just so much that Canada can do. We no longer have the fear of what Trump might do hanging over our heads. The government has no excuse, and now is the time to act and echoing uh, Doug's earlier comment about, we all have to make our, M our MPs uh, hear this message. Every one of us must, uh, must engage in that. Thank you. Thanks, Peggy. Um, and Doug mentioned- uh, um... Just picking up on- Sorry? Well, picking up on, picking up on Peggy's last point, uh, the arrival of Joe Biden in the White House does give Canada a new moment, a new opportunity. Um, uh, and, and I think, uh, well, certainly the, the arms sales to Saudi Arabia are, are a disgrace and, 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 and they deserve the condemnation that, that, they, that they just received. But uh, uh, on the other hand, Canada, it cannot be said that Canada is not doing anything. I mean, I mean, Prime Minister Trudeau has uh, co-chaired with the Jamaican Prime Minister an effort to uh, refigure the financial mechanisms uh, through the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank to help those countries most affected by COVID. So we, we are doing some things. We have we have been in, involved in peace building work at the, at the United Nations, and uh, we're we're trying to establish uh, a, 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 a pol policies of. Uh, of the gender equity and, and the whole question of women's rights uh, uh, being given being given a stronger push in the international system. So let it not be said that the uh, Canada devoid of the present activities. That the problem is that 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 we work we we hence by uh, a, a hangover of fear that uh, Washington is going to object. Uh, to uh, to us is taking taking a stand and, and advancing in in such issues as the prohibition treaty. I think that uh, Bridget has come back on. Uh, perhaps uh, there's some questions uh, queuing up in the Q and A section, Bridget. That's right. Thanks, Fergus. Um, yeah, we do have some very interesting questions. And I'd like to begin with um, the first one, which is, is this optimistic message compatible with the increased bipolar rivalry between China and the United States and the pressure to make other countries choose sides? Well, uh, this question of China is, is immense. 
uh, the Belt and Road Initiative shows that China is extending its, its influence all around the world. And, and it's, it's, it's going to be huge, absolutely huge in the 21st century. Um, but I think that uh, Biden himself has seized this as a competition and not necessarily a confrontation with China. Um, he, he's, he's, he's boasted about his friendship with President Xi of, of China. And uh, who, who knows what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, but I, I would not uh, be myself discouraged just because China is an autocratic state and because there is, there is a repression of the Muslims and the Uyghurs I and mean, all those things are terrible that they're going on. But China has to be dealt with and, and has to be dealt with in, in, in a manner of dialogue. And I would say, let's stop. Uh, to give diplomacy a chance in this new era, let us try to build on what we can find in common ground. And that goes for China as well as other countries. Hey, if you want to jump in? Yes, I want to jump in too. Um, Doug, I certainly, I certainly hope you're right because um, before the inauguration, um, I think we had all thought that Biden understood and he did articulate and certainly on climate, for example, I mean, China, cooperation with China is absolutely fundamental to make any progress uh, to avert climate catastrophe and uh, on a range of other issues as well and international you know, security dialogue to reduce nuclear risks and so on. But unfortunately, since uh, you know, his first 100 days in office, and this has been carried through also with, uh, with the Secretary of Defense and also the, the Secretary of State, uh, there, there has been rhetoric that has been far beyond what was expected. Really hostile, aggressive rhetoric, including um, I mean, interestingly, it didn't seem to be the case with Russia. We just got a readout of the meeting, and that seemed to be more businesslike. But the um, the meeting, I think it was the Alaska meeting with China, I mean, the language uh, and the press conference and everything was, was extraordinarily hostile. And, you know, as any good analyst will tell you, uh, backing great powers into a corner, publicly humiliating them, is not, a, is not a basis for cooperation. He has tremendous domestic pressure. There's a massive domestic chorus in the United States and a bipartisan consensus, essentially. Biden better not be soft on China. And we know he has to watch his back on that. But I think in terms of the rhetoric, he's gone too far. So I certainly hope now lots of good voices, respected voices, progressive voices in the US are trying to get that message through um, because uh, cooperation with China on uh, global uh, problems that require global solutions um, is, absolutely, uh, is absolutely fundamental. And it's really the basis for making progress in those other areas where we don't agree with what China is doing at all. Thanks, Peggy. I'm gonna jump in with another question because there are quite a few and uh, I'm sure there's there's, um, well, there's a, definitely lots to talk about. The next one is about Palestine. And the people of Palestine have suffered from a bias uh, against the, their national rights by many of Western powers. Consequently, that problem is still with us for much longer than need be. Can President Biden make a difference? Well, uh, it's, it's, it's too early to make any kind of strong statement. I mean, he's, uh, whether he's got Palestine and his, his private media conversations, I don't know. I mean, he's got so much going on right now. But I think that um, the, uh, the, the uh, manner in which uh, Netanyahu, uh, the, uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, uh, has bulldozed his, his way through the United States policy is, uh, is over. And that's been to the detriment of the Palestinians. So I can only hope uh, that uh, Biden will reach out and, and recognize that the agreements that were made over the past 20, 30 years and various types of agreements can be revived in a better atmosphere. 
let me just jump in very, very briefly. That the end of the question was, can President Biden make a difference? President Biden can make all the difference. The question is whether or not he will. And again, this is an issue of domestic politics as well as international, although happily, you know, the situation in the U.S. is becoming, I mean, the new generation of uh, Jewish Americans don't necessarily have the same views as some, uh, as some in the older generation. And, uh, and so, you know, let's hope, let's very, very much hope that he does um, take a more uh, progressive approach here, which would be long, long overdue. I'll ask, thank you, Peggy. And I'll ask one more set of questions. It's, I'll put two together. And that is, what in view, your view are the chances that President Biden will pull back on planned US spending on nuclear weapons? And can we get an PM of Canada to promote no first use in NATO? Yeah. Well, uh, Biden has said uh, repeatedly that uh, that he considers nuclear weapons for uh, defensive purposes and to deter a war. I mean, I, I don't agree with that. This opens up a wide discussion of, uh, of nuclear, nuclear disarmament. Um, and it's, it's still too early to, uh, to make any forecast of where Biden will go. He has renewed, as I said earlier, he, re he has renewed the START agreement that, that, that reduces long-range missiles between Russia and the United States. He's extended that, that agreement with Russia, and he signaled uh, quite strongly that he wants the Iran agreement revived. Uh, North Korea presents a problem for him. He said he's not going to meet with the North Korean leader, but that, 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 that doesn't mean that there's that the six-party talks for North Korea are, uh, will not be reestablished. Uh, and the non-proliferation treaty is still to be reviewed. It, it, it's, it's supposed to be reviewed later this year as to whether or not the United States uh, will um, reaffirm the uh, statements that the, the consensus statements that the non-proliferation treaty has made over the years uh, that revolve around the question of uh, the, 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 the the unequivocal undertaking to the total elimination of nuclear weapons via a, pro a program of comprehensive negotiations. We have yet to see whether the Biden administration will, will enter fully in a respectful manner. Uh, I, I am not without hope. Uh, the new administration will take a more constructive attitude, attitude of constructive engagement with the other states on lowering the dangers of nuclear weapons by, by maintaining a program of reductions and uh, recognizing that uh, they have a responsibility uh, to, the, to other countries uh, that, have, that have shown their displeasure with the major powers, their recalcitrance to do serious nuclear disarmament, and that's what brought about the Prohibition Treaty. So we have yet to see whether the Biden administration will drop the U.S. opposition to the Prohibition Treaty that has been pronounced over the past few years. And uh, this answer could go on for a long time, but I, I feel that uh, that I want to give them a chance. and and. Coming back to Canada, this is this is the ideal moment for Canada to raise itself, raise its own voice respectfully in advancing. This is what Pierre Trudeau did, you know, 30 years ago, and it's what Canada needs to do again today to help the U.S. exercise its responsibilities of leadership in nuclear disarmament. Richard, I think that. Uh... Uh, Tamara has some um, some focused questions on uh, nuclear weapons as well. So maybe this is a good point to bring her in and, and ask her to, because uh, the, the nuclear weapons chapter is, is the, uh, the most comprehensive in, in the book. And, and uh, we should deal with that a little bit more at length. Good evening, everyone. I'm speaking to you from Waterloo, the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the neutral peoples of the Grand River. I'm really happy to be with you all and to um, 
to launch and discuss uh, Doug's new book. This is the 22nd book of Doug, so congratulations. And I'd like to just quickly um, uh, go through some observations that I had on the book. And, and that is, while I was reading it, Doug, I was really impressed with your clear-eyed and courageous comments that you make throughout. So for instance, at the beginning of the book, you wrote, to put it plainly and simply, the American political system is corrupted by militarism. This is the system that President Biden will have to deal with. And then later in the book, you challenged us, you called on Canadians to free up our thinking and cease worrying whether Washington or NATO headquarters approves of our foreign policy decisions. And you urged Canada to act independently. Uh, I hope those are the words that Ottawa will heed. And throughout the book, you repeatedly emphasize that our foreign policy, both Canadian and American foreign policy should be guided by global cooperation and by nonviolence, by nonviolence. Those are the words uh, truly of a wise elder. So I wanna just thank you for that. Before I say that on the issue of nuclear disarmament, um, in the chapter that you have, Steering Towards a Nuclear Weapons Free World, you, you discuss the US $1.7 trillion 30-year modernization program. And we know that it's the big US weapons manufacturers, Boeing, General Dynamics, um, Lockheed Martin, and Northrop Grumman that stand to benefit, that stand to benefit. This is the military industrial complex that Biden is up against. So one of the questions that I have for you is, you know, um, how do you think Biden can really take on these nuclear weapons producing companies, this military industrial complex? And then also, I would like to hear from you uh, more specifics about how Canada can show leadership for nuclear disarmament as a middle power. Um, you know, while we're in the while we're in NATO, um, a nuclear armed military alliance. So, you know, these are the two questions that I have. As you uh, as you mentioned in your chapter, Canada is not joining. The, this critical new treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons that came into force on January 22nd of this year because of our membership in NATO. So Doug, what do we do? Well, thank you, Tamara. First of all, I'm very touched by your kind comments on my book and coming from you. Will Biden take on the military industrial complex? I doubt it. Uh, the military industrial complex constrained Barack Obama, who went out and won the Nobel Peace Prize for himself by uh, advocating a nuclear weapons free world. And when he tried to apply it in his own administration, he got surrounded and, and, and chained to his desk, so to speak. Uh, this is how powerful the military industrial complex is, but it's not new. It was We were warned about it by Dwight Eisenhower in 1961, for heaven's sakes. And the, and the tentacles of the military industrial complex have only grown since then, and whereby they, they uh, have a consortium of Democratic and Republican uh, Congress persons uh, and the Armed Services Committee uh, who work together, hand in fist together, uh, to keep the military budget high, 750, approximately $750 billion. The United States spends more than the next 15 countries, but uh, together on, 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 on militarism. I mean, we could go on for a long time about the excesses of U.S. military spending as a result of the power of the military industrial complex. Joe Biden understands this all too well, which is why I think he is not going to fight them. He's going to try to go around them. And if he even going around them is, is at least maybe a, a start Toward the reduction by a reduction of, of the reduction of the growth of military spending, it won't grow maybe as fast, and uh, eliminating one of the triads of, uh, of nuclear weapons, and uh, a more a, a, a better uh, approach to uh, recognizing how to get comprehensive negotiations going. Um, Biden cannot do this alone. Uh, the, the opposition inside the United States is, is uh, in the Congress is, is overwhelming. 
and he needs uh, he needs um, the support of uh, if, if, even if he wants to move down this avenue, he needs the support of, of a range of middle power countries of, of Germany and uh, Sweden and Me Mexico and, and and Canada as as a, as a beginning of a list of middle power countries that, that can have influence. So. Uh, I, I think that, uh, as I said before, uh, I, I express myself this way, but I am not without hope that uh, Biden can play a constructive role in this. Canadian leadership and, and, and the NATO question. Look, we're in NATO, uh, whether we like it or not, we're a member of NATO. Uh, it, when the Cold War ended, the biggest mistake of all time was made when NATO did not dissolve as the Warsaw Pact dissolved. NATO should have, uh, should have dissolved. What did they do? They they uh, they enlarged themselves and, and sort of virtually surrounding Russia, intimidating Russia, all through the 1990s and, and the 2000s, and so we're now in this terrible situation where uh, NATO is aggrandized itself, and uh, Canada uh, and and is pushing back against the 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 will of 122 states that have signed. Uh, that have uh, voted for the new treaty and the prohibition of nuclear weapons. And so NATO has pinned itself against a tide of history that's closing in on it. And Canada is torn through its membership and its loyalty to NATO on the one hand, political loyalty to NATO and its, its continued professed desire uh, to advance uh, toward a nuclear weapons free world. So Canada has to decide which way it's going to go. I believe that Canada should be should do what it did 20 years ago when Lloyd Axworthy went on behalf of the government of Canada to NATO and asked for a review of their nuclear weapons policies. The review was conducted, and and they published the review, which maintained the status quo. So it didn't move off the center, but the times have changed, and more countries now, particularly Germany inside NATO is qu questioning. Germany was very critical of the United Kingdom's expansion of nuclear weapons just a week or two ago. Why did not Canada speak out? So this is the question of, of how it needs to summon up its courage, its convictions, and be backed, I think, by a reasonable reading of public opinion. Is public opinion in Canada strong enough to support a Canadian government strong effort to push back against NATO? That is a question that's in my mind. Doug, I would just like to, to add quickly to what you said, and that for the Canadian government to change its position on um, signing the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, it's really uh, critical that it hears from Canadians. So at the end of your book, you write, uh, the question all of us need to ask is what can we do for peace? And what can we can do is put pressure on our members of parliament, um, on the prime ministers to say that we care about nuclear disarmament. We, we want our country to, uh, to join the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And then I also just want to add to what you said that another source of hope for me in the United States is the, pro the, the new progressive uh, Democrats that are in the House and that are in the Senate. So I'm thinking, for instance, of the, the new Georgia Senator Raphael Warnock and, um, and the squad, um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and um, and, and others, Barbara Lee, they have been working really hard on trying to push for bills to cut military spending. So I think it will be a, um, imperative for President Biden to work very closely with the progressive uh, wing of his party to try to get the, the, the legislation that Americans so desperately need for peace and human security. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Coming back to Canada on this, if, if Canadians want to take an action, I mean, they should write to liberal members of parliament, liberal members of parliament. Inside the Liberal caucus today, there is discussion on what to do. And they're not happy, some of them, not all, but some are not happy with the government's weaseling, the Canadian government's weaseling on the, its attitude to the Prohibition Treaty. So uh, some of those liberal members Parliament are vulnerable and unlikely to come 
as we as we know, too distant future. I'm asked about what 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 can we do? What, what you know? I'm only one person. That's a great big world out there. Well, single out a vulnerable politician and, and contact him and her. Okay, let's. Uh, we're almost out of time, but maybe we can throw this back to Bridget and see if there are a few additional questions. Thank you, Fergus. Uh, yep, we definitely have some questions. And one is actually from your, your friend, Doug, uh, Tad Daly from Los Angeles. And he's asking what kind of arguments can be made to President Biden to co convince them that supporting that and perhaps other global governance initiatives can both benefit American national interests and also benefit Joe Biden politically. Yes, well, that's a very good question indeed. Uh, I think that uh, appealing to the sense of leadership that the United States has had historically, and its responsibility for maintaining democracy as a, as a major, as the major system uh, for the world to advance uh, uh, security uh, security questions in their in their broad dimension, and uh, I believe that all this will redound to uh, Joe Biden's uh, uh, political and, and electoral success uh, if, if the American people get a sense of confidence that he understands that uh, human security today depends not on weapons but on uh, education and on health and all the accoutrements that go into the whole United Nations agenda. This is a moment that uh, it, it is. It's, it's been great minds have been talking about this the last few weeks and months. This is, this is a major, major turning point in world history and uh, we need to be part of it. And Canada, as an important middle power country, this is this is a, this is a, a we have a we have a real responsibility, and all of us, particularly on this program, I mean, if if you're watching this program, you're already interested in in in, in world world affairs, and so we, we need to increase our own strength, and 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 and, and, and reaffirm our sense of confidence that each one of us can in in our own way can make a difference in building the conditions for peace in the world and, and impressing upon the new Biden administration their responsibilities. Thank you very much. And I think this is a good good place to end. We, uh, my task is to keep us on time. And I think we've heard you loud and clear. We've learned a lot from you this evening. And the message is really that there is a lot we can all do. And it's very important that we do connect with our members of parliament and connect with all of the, particularly the liberal members of parliament and, and get ca Canadian politicians active as well as uh, anybody who has connections in the States. So thank you very much for all of the panelists for your rich discussions this evening. I'd like to also mention that the, the book is available, The Recovery, um, piece in prospects in the Biden era. Uh, Mr. Roach's book is available through Amazon and Goodreads, and there are electronic versions. The Kobo versions are available through Chapters and Indigo. And thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you all for, for Thanks, your wonderful, wonderful participation. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you.